To exploit a client-side desync, we first need to detect it using Burp. And for that, we need to find an endpoint that only supports HTTP 1.1 and also ignores content length. And the best candidates for that are endpoints that wouldn't normally expect a POST request. And for this lab, we'll send a POST request to an endpoint that will issue a server-level redirect. So let's switch to Burp and go to proxy and HTTP history. And we see three requests here. The first request, the get request for the front page. The server issues a 302 redirect to the slash en endpoint, probably for English. So let's pick this first request to the slash endpoint and send it to repeater and switch to repeater. Now the first thing we want to prove, so for client-side desync via the browser, browsers aggressively prefer HTTP 2 over HTTP 1.1. So we want to make sure that this endpoint doesn't support HTTP 2, otherwise our attack won't work once we test it in the browser. So I'm going to go to the right here under the inspector window to request attributes, upgrade the protocol to HTTP 2, and then I'm going to send the request again. You can see at the bottom here that we get an error, server ALPN does not advertise HTTP 2 support. So the server isn't advertising that support within the TLS handshake. Even if we go under the request settings and we allow an HTTP 2 ALPN override and then send the request again, we get an error again saying stream failed to close correctly. So that proves that this endpoint doesn't support HTTP 2. So it's a viable target for us to continue our detection for the client-side desync. I'm going to go back to the right here and downgrade the protocol to HTTP 1.1 again, and then send the request just to make sure that we get back a 302 found. And we do. So let's go back to the request here and right click and change the request method over to post. I'm also going to delete unnecessary headers just to clean things up or trim it down. So anything up from content type, up to user agent, and let's keep the cookie book because we'll need that later on. I'm going to delete the lab analytics cookie though. So we'll just have this. And let me show new line just to make sure that there's a carriage return line feed after the content length. I'm just going to send this request just to test whether this endpoint actually supports a uh, post request and that it doesn't throw us like a 405 uh, error saying method not supported. It does, but we have content length zero here. Let's try and modify it to content length 20 and then go to the request settings as well and turn off update content length automatically. And then let's send this request. And we get, a, we get a response pretty much immediately. And that's a bit unexpected because, because we've set a content length of 20 without sending any bytes in the body. You'd normally expect that the server would wait for the 20 bytes to come in and eventually send the timeout because the, the bytes aren't coming in. But because we get an immediate response, that means that we've detected a potential client-side desync here. So now we can use a differential response technique to confirm the vulnerability where we're going to send an attack request and a normal response and see if the attack request can influence the response to the normal request. So I'm going to go over to the, the tab name here and rename this to attack request. And then I'm going to go to proxy and HTTP history and then grab the get slash en request here because that just gets back a, a normal 200 response. So I'm going to send that to repeater. And that will become our normal request. So I'm just going to rename this tab to normal request and then switch back to the attack request. First thing I want to do is turn on update content length automatically again. And then I'm going to add a connection header. And I'm going to set the value to keep alive because we want to make sure that after this request is sent, that the server keeps the connection open. You can see that it's underlined. You have to go to um, the request settings here and make sure that you enable HTTP 1 connection reuse as well. And then you can see the dotted lines are gone. So this header will now take effect in Burp. The next thing we want to do is add our smuggled request. So we're going to add a get request for something that doesn't exist using HTTP 1.1. And then we're going to add a X ignore header for a value of X, not followed by a new line. So just the X because we want to make sure that when we send this normal request, that it's appended right after here so that we don't have an issue where, you know, here the get request comes right after x ignore x. We want to make sure that it doesn't come here so that we have two request methods with get and a, and a separate URI path because that will cause an error. So I'm just going to remove that again. So just make sure that there's no carriage return line feed after the x. The next thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we send these in succession over the same TCP connection. So to do that, I'm going to create a tab group going to rename it to CSD and then add the attack request and the normal request and create it. And you want to go here under the settings for the, the, the group send options and make sure that send group in sequence is selected for over a single TCP connection. 
and that should be it. So when we send this, what we expect is that for the normal request for slash en, normally this would give a 200 OK. But if we if our attack is successful, we'll see a 404. So I'm going to send this request and then go to the normal request. And we can see, indeed, we receive a 404 not found. So that confirms the client side desync vulnerability for this endpoint. So now we want to make sure that this exploit works within the browser as well. And we can write it in a separate Google Chrome session in, a, in the console tab. But I prefer to write it in VS Code first because we have syntax highlighting here and that makes it a bit easier. So we want to use the fetch function to fetch the front page. So I'm just going to copy the, the whole setter here and then paste it for the front page. And then for the um, properties for this uh, fetch request, we want to make sure that we use the method post. And for the body, we want to make sure, because we're just trying to simulate what we had here in the attack request. So we want to make sure that we add our smuggled request here so that it will be a get request for something that doesn't exist using HTTP 1.1, followed by a carriage return line feed. We do have to inject it as a string here within the body parameter and then uh, set an x ignore header for a value of x, not followed by a new line. Now, something that's a bit special, we also have to set credentials to include. This is because modern browsers um, use different HTTP connection pools for requests that contain session cookies and requests that don't. And we're, we want to make sure that we um, are within the with cookies connection pool. So I'm going to say ensure we use the with cookies connection pool. And then underneath, we also want to set the mode to course. And this is a bit peculiar. I'm just making sure that I have a comma here as well. Because we want to make sure that when we go to the home page here, the front page, the server will issue a 302 redirect. We want to make sure that that 302 redirect is not followed. Otherwise, it will break our request smuggling. And we can do that by setting the mode to course. And because the response from the server doesn't contain an access control allow origin header, this will throw an error. And that error we can then catch here underneath and then continue with our request smuggling and, and send the, the normal request afterwards. Uh, so this will, I'll add as a comment, will elicit an error, ensures we don't follow the 302 redirect. So that's it for the attack request. Now for the normal request, first we want to catch the, the error that we threw because of setting the mode to course. And then we're going to use an anonymous function here. And then we're going to do another fetch request, but this time for, and I'm going to go up here and copy this and then go back down and paste it. But I'm going to request the slash en endpoint because that under normal conditions would uh, retrieve a, a 200 response from the server. And then for the properties of this request, I'm going to set the mode to no course, because it won't trigger an error. And then I'm going to go back, make sure that there's a comma here. And then for credentials, we want to make sure that we set it to include as well to make sure that we're within the same connection pool as the attack request above. And that's it. So now we have, we have our attack request here, we have our normal request. And that should be similar to what we did in Burp before. So now I'm just going to copy everything here and then switch to a separate uh, Chrome session that has our lab loaded. I'm going to open the uh, web console here and then go to the network tab. Make sure that preserve log is uh, switched on. And I'll go back to the console and I'm just going to paste what we wrote in VS Code before. Hit enter. And we already see a get request here. We get a 404 not found. So that looks good. Let's go to the network tab. And we can see our first attack request, which is a post request to the, the front page. Get a 302 found. And in the payload, yeah, we have our smuggled request. And then we have our normal request here. And in the headers, we can see it's a get request for the slash en endpoint, which normally would receive a 200 response. But because uh, the backend or the server was poisoned by the prefix um, for the get request for a resource that doesn't exist, the normal request was appended to that. And then we get a 404 not found for this resource here. So that confirms that the client side desync works from the browser as well. So now we need to prove that there's actual impact as well from this request smuggling vulnerability. So we're going to prove that by finding an exploitable gadget. And we're going to attempt to store our victim's request so that we can leak their session cookie. And the app we're targeting um, allows users to add a comment to a blog post. And we can leverage that functionality 
in our smuggled requests. So I'm just going to go to a blog post here, the first one. I'm going to add a comment. So let's say foo, name fooby, foo at bar.com, gp bar.com, and post the comment and then switch to burp and go to proxy and HTTP history. And we have the post request for the comment here. I'm going to send it to repeater. Switch back to repeater. I'm just going to send it again just to make sure that we get a 302 found, which uh, signals that the posting of the comment was successful. Because we need to turn this into a fetch request in the browser later on, I'm going to try and simplify this request and trim it down as much as possible. So I'm going to remove unnecessary headers. So accept language. So I'm going to leave the connection close header. And then I'm going to remove accept language, uh, sec fetch site, accept. I'm going to leave the content type. And then the origin header can go as well. Cache control can go. I'm going to leave the content length because we need that. For the cookie, I don't think we need the lab analytics cookie, so I'm going to remove that as well. And yep, that looks good to me. Now, the next thing we want to do is move the comment here. Because our normal request or our victim's normal request is going to come after, we want to make sure that the comment is added here so that the victim's normal request will be appended after. Next thing we want to do is, and I've seen this in a previous lab, we want to make sure or try and see if we can do it without URL encoding because um, I've seen that cause an error before and that will make troubleshooting a bit difficult. So I'm just going to try and remove this and then send the request again. And we still get a 302 found. So this simplified request is still working. And we can use that now in our attack request. So now I'm going to copy our entire simplified post request here and go to our attack request. And then instead of our get request for something that doesn't exist that we tried to smuggle in previously, I'm just going to paste this instead. Uh, one thing we have to look at is the content length here. So I'm going to dock the inspector window to the left to make it a bit easier to see. But the content length here is 112, which matches if I select our request body here, which matches the length because the selected text is 112 bytes as well. But we want to make sure that we increase that a little bit because we want to make sure that we can see some of the bits of the normal request that will come after here as a comment. So I'm going to increase this to something like 200. And then that should check out. So I'm going to send this over a single connection again. Same thing we did before. We get a 302 found. And we get a 302 found here in the normal request. So that would signal that there was a comment posted. So I'm going to go back here and back to the blog. If I go to the bottom here, yeah, you can see that there's our comment foo. And then we have the get request that was actually part of the normal request because it was requesting slash en here. So now we just need to make sure or prove that it works within the browser as well. So I'm going to switch back to burp and then go to our attack request and just copy it entirely and then go to VS Code. And I'm going to add it as a comment again, just so I have it as a reference. It can be quite handy. Paste it here. And then I'm also going to go up here and let's see, paste our fetch request that we did previously and paste it at the bottom so we can reuse most of it except for the body. And then center this again. Now, all we need to do is go into our request body here and replace it with our smuggled request that will post a comment. Now, it's a bit more error prone to do it uh, like we did before because there's more headers and a bit more body to, to put in. And separating all of them manually with a carriage during line feed, like backslash or backslash n, is a bit more error prone. So I think what I'm going to do is declare a variable um, smuggled request and then declare it as an array. And I'm just going to copy this over here and paste it. And then put it into the, the array. So surround it with quotation marks. This line as well. This will become an empty line. And then just add a comma everywhere. And save it. And then we can just do a join here. And say we do a join, but we want to separate everything with a carriage return line feed. And then instead of our body here, we can say smuggled request, followed by a comma. I'm just going to add a new line here. Let's see. And that should work. So we can use that in the browser. So I'm just going to go up to the smuggled request and yank everything until the end, and then switch to our browser here. And this is the, the separate uh, Chrome session that we have uh, that is not tied into uh, Burp. So just want to make sure that we clear the network logs here. 
and then go to the console, I'm gonna do a clear here as well, and then just paste what we wrote before in VS Code, hit enter, and we can see a promise pending here. We have a response, so let's go to the network tab, and we can see our first request here, so our post request to the normal front page, get a 302 found, our payload is our smuggled request, and then for EN here, let's see the headers, we get a 302 found where normally we'd expect a 200 okay. So the 300, 302 found would indicate that the posting of the comment was successful because we also get a redirect here to post ID two. So if we go to post ID two and refresh the page, yep, we can see our request. So we can see that the, the smuggling also works from the browser. Now we can try and deliver the exploit to our victim using the exploit server. So I'm gonna go up here and just open the lab in a new tab. Just go to the EN page and then go to the exploit server. So all we need to do is add script tags here, and close them. And then I'm gonna go back to VS Code and just make sure that we have everything copied. Go back to the lab and paste it. And that looks, that looks good. So let's store this and then deliver the exploit to our victim. There we go, exploit delivered. So let's go back to the previous tab where we had the post ID2 open and refresh it. Yep. And we can see a new post. So this will, or this is a new comment. So this is a comment um, for a get request coming from our victim. So the session cookie is in here somewhere, but we can't see it yet because the content length we set is probably too low. So I'm going to increase it to, let's say, 500 store it, and then deliver the exploit again. And then go back to post ID two, refresh the page. We can already see a bit more of our victims request. You can already see here the user agent is victim. So that ensures it's a victim headless Chrome. Let's go back to the lab here and then increase the content length to, let's say 820, and store it, and then deliver it again. We just want to make sure we don't set it too high either. Otherwise, our victim's request will time out. Refresh it again. And yep, we can see the session cookie of our victim here. So let's copy that. And then I'm going to go to our second tab here and open the developer console and go to application over here in the menu. And then if you go to cookies and then our site here, we have a session cookie here. So let's replace that and then refresh the page. And if I close the developer console, you can see, congratulations, you've solved the lab. If I go to my account, we're logged in as the administrator. I hope this was helpful to you and thank you for watching.